The church is prophetic, it is supernatural, it is moral, it is humanitarian. And of course, the society in which we live would like to get rid of the supernatural and the prophetic and relegate us to being moral and humanitarian because they don't want us to speak into the society. But the reality is that God has given the church a prophetic voice. God has given the church a moral voice, a redemptive voice, and a humanitarian voice. And I like what was said earlier that we have prophetic laryngitis because it is so true. And we've come out of a season, and I've been pastoring for 37 years. And I've watched the different waves come and go, the different movements come and go. And unfortunately, the prophetic be became nothing but fortune telling. And instead of wanting to understand the plans of God, people wanted to know who they were going to marry and what was going to happen to them in the next six months. And it got to the place where you can dial up a prophecy for 1999. So it's easy for us to lose focus and understand our purpose and what we are called to. And there has to be a call back. And that is really the prophetic ministry because the prophetic is predictive to the future but primarily analytical to the present. I'll say it again. The prophetic is predictive to the future because the prophets did, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, look into the future and make predictions. But primarily, the prophetic was analytic to the present. Because the church's prophetic voice is the capacity to discern the times in which we live and understand the signs of the times, to discern the trends, political, social, spiritual, and moral trends, and determine the direction that society can end up in, given these trends and the continuation of those trends. Jesus' problem with the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes, was that they were looking for a sign. They were looking for that which would be predictive and fail to appreciate that which was analytical. So he said to them, he said, you're able to discern the face of the sky and determine what the weather will be tonight or in the morning, but you fail to discern the signs of the times. And signs in the Greek there is actually prophetic indicators that emanate from the character of the culture. I'll say it again. Signs are prophetic indicators that emanate from the character of the culture. It is expressed in the titles of books and movies and songs like Blurred Lines. It is a song, a very popular song. The content is questionable because it lends itself to the denigration of women. However, the title itself is applicable to the reality that lines are being blurred morally, socially, and when it comes to gender identity in our society. Is this all right? Am I free here? Can we talk tonight? I believe more in dialogue and conversation than monologue. Jesus saved us into an ideal position in eternity. But he left us to live out our days in the reality of human experience. He even came to our planet, became one of us, to live it out in humanity, to experience what we experience, so that when we would pray to him, we could never utter these words, God, you don't understand. That is a foolish prayer. That's an uninformed prayer. Because he was in all points tempted, tested, tried as we are. 
And the scripture says that his life is the example for us to follow. That we should walk in his footsteps. I'm going to say that again. That we should walk in his footsteps. See, a lot of folks want to live in his shadow, but not walk in his footsteps. And when you walk in someone's shadows, you, you do experience the benefit of their anointing, but you never develop the character that carries that anointing. It's not until you walk in someone's footsteps that you develop the character that can handle the anointing. And that's why Jesus said, there's many things I'd like to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And the word bear there in the Greek means that you don't have the constitution in order to stand under the weight of responsibility I'm about to put on your shoulders. And you can't do it until the Holy Spirit comes. So you're going to have to dig again. It's all fortuitous. It's all connected. Every word, every word. I live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But you have to humble yourself to believe you need some word that you ain't heard. You should, oh, you're not listening to me. Listen, you tune on your ears, baby. You need some word you haven't heard. Otherwise, we would not need a conference. A conference means to confer. We're going to put something on us that we have not had in us. And we're going to talk to people that we have not talked to so we can confer together. Words have meaning and purpose. This is not a summit. That's a different agenda. But in a conference, you best confer something on me. Bestow something on me. Give me what I didn't have. Take me higher. Proclaim me. Affirm me. And then talk to me at my mind level. Appreciate my intellect that I might go somewhere. So let us be very clear. The purpose of this message is to present a vision of shift, which we, the laborers, the ministry leaders and workers, we can work it. The vision of our presiders at every local church work be excellent, and we are designed to create that excellence and equip you to do that work. But we are going to have to have an action interpretation that we can execute efficiently and excellently without interruption or the typical excuses. We must execute consistently in every ministry regardless of your size, location, or resources. Because since you say that God is with you, you are no longer able to tell us what you can't do. What did she say? I said that your location, your numeration, your whatever Asian you have been using as your justification for why you can't do or be. If you have the audacity to say that our God is with you, you may no longer offer your previous excuse or previous practice for your lack of growth. Not when we have a vision, a visionary carrying out the original founder's revelation. You need to understand. So like Mary, I say to you from this point, whatsoever he, Jesus, saith unto you, do it. I interpret this passage as follows. Whatever God speaks to us through his word, by his spirit, and through his messengers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, whatever true sent, not self-licensed, self-proclaimed, but God-given sent gifts, speak to us. Do it quickly, do it expeditiously, and do it exactly as instructed. I've written out this manuscript because God said, this time you preach from paper every word that I give you, and then I'll tell you how to close. 
So in other words, whatever God speaks to us, we must have immediate, immediate, irrevocable obedience to the word of God, which means, pastors, this <laughs> is over. <laughs> and I got, please, ma'am and ladies, why are you trying to sound like me? And listen, and men, why are you still trying to sound like Franklin who had a breathing impediment? And because of his asthma, he was trying to get his breath so that he might carry the weight of the anointing and you have all picked it up and thought it was a preaching style from God and it was evidence of an infirmity. So you are preaching a weakness that isn't even yours. Step away from the instruments. Don't do it. Don't start nothing, won't be nothing. So I'm going to finish teaching. What, what, about, what about the eulogistic services of King David? That the Bible says that even heaven sent an unusual telegram that was ringing with unusual sympathy. For in fact, the telegram read something like this, be it hereby recorded in the archives of human history that David is a man after God's own heart, a murderer and an adulterer. And God identifies that he's a man after my heart because God does some strange things. Come on, pastors, you've read and studied there are even some indisputable evidences of God doing some strange things on Calvary. Y'all remember he was hanging there on Calvary between two thieves. There was a thief on the left and a thief on the right. And the Bible says that one thief repents before he dies. And he looks over to the Messiah, the man on the middle cross. And this thief said to Jesus, when you enter into your kingdom, remember me. When you go into paradise, this, king, uh, this thief said, remember me. And the Bible says that Jesus stopped dying, looked over to this thief on the cross and said to him, today, you shall be with me in paradise. Y'all know God does some strange things. But what really gets me about that episode is the definiteness that this thief, a penitent thief, receives heaven at the last minute. God does some strange things. My, my flesh got a little agitated with that because here it is, this thief, this thief ain't never been to Sunday school. Thief never went to Baptist training union. Thief never been to new members orientation. My flesh says that he should have at least been baptized. But none of that happened and immediately he goes to paradise on the personal escort of the arm of Jesus. God says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. God does some strange things is what I want every one of you who raised your hand a moment ago to say you needed to hear from God, he's talking to you right now. And I want you to understand that anyone who has ever been used of God greatly has gone through the order of breaking bread. I'm going to say that again. Show me somebody who has an anointing on their life. And I'll show you someone who's gone through the order of breaking bread. And some of you have come here to Nashville this week so God can give you some clarity in the midst of your chaos. Show me somebody who has used of God greatly and I'll show you someone who's gone through the order 
of breaking bread. We got a new presiding bishop. Years ago, Shreveport, Louisiana, God took him, took him and brought him to Nashville, put him in the Mount Zion Church, Jefferson Street. All of a sudden now, God bless him. People coming from everywhere. Young lives being transformed, being changed. God took Bishop Walker. God blessed Bishop Walker. But y'all know the story. After God blessed him, God broke him. But he lived through the broken. And it is because of his brokenness that we are here today. I want you to do me a favor, grab your neighbor by the hand and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, tell him I cannot testify. Tell him because God took me and God blessed me. Look at him and say, no, you didn't hear me. Tell him God really blessed me. Tell him everything in my life was wonderful. Do I have a witness in the room? But don't drop your neighbor's hand. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, after he took me. Come on, testify. Let him know he broke me. He broke me down until my business got in the street. He broke me down until I didn't have the strength to praise him. Matthew 13, verses 34 and 35, the Bible makes an interesting statement. The Bible says that when Jesus taught the people, he never taught them without a parable. And so if you are called to teach the word, you are familiar with a term called par a parabolic form. What parabolic form really is, is when you take a thing that's unknown, you set it before the people, then you take another thing that's known, and then you show the similarities between the unknown and the known. And what you're telling the people is, if you can gather or if you can understand the known then you really have already understood the unknown. It's called parabolic form. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, the invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Or the things that, so what it's saying is, everything that's invisible to us or unknown to us in God's kingdom, there's something in the earth that was created that looks just like it. And so be careful when you read scripture, take, prop, uh, take or pay proper attention to what God calls a thing. Because he's the divine designer. He's the creator. God, can, he could have called it anything. Now, this is interesting, uh, 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 Bishop Walker. I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess with your first name for a minute. Do you know in scripture, the name Joseph is mentioned three times? There are three different Josephs. And each time they're introduced to salvage or to rescue the plan of God. Now, I'm going to tell, tell, tell you what I know. Now, this is interesting. The first Joseph comes. He's on the scene. He's thrown into a pit. He's sold uh, to e in Egypt to Potiphar. He's falsely accused, goes to jail as a sexual offender. And then he, he's taken to Pharaoh where he devises a plan to save not only Egypt but the rest of the world and preserve God's promise to Abraham. The second Joseph comes on the scene, and Mary is, is uh, accosted by the angel, told that she's going to have a child by the Holy Ghost. Most men, <laughs> but Joseph, Joseph was cool with it, and Joseph uh, was a surrogate father. He sired the Messiah. The third Joseph of Arimathea, Watch the dead body of the Lord on the cross and goes to the powers that be and begs for the body of Jesus. The Bible says he treats the body, prepares the body for burial. and put, He was rich, by the way, and he puts the body in his tomb to fulfill prophecy. Three times in Scripture there's a Joseph on the scene and three times they're rescuing or completing what someone else started. I'm going to tell you this. Be transparent before your people. What God said to Paul was this. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. 
He says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now, I'm going to tell you something. God anoints your gift, but he builds his throne in your weakness. If you want to know where God is in your life, survey your weakness. He builds his throne where you're weak. I stood before my congregation one Sunday, and I was very transparent. As a matter of fact, this past Sunday, and I was sharing with them some things that, that we were walking through, and I said to them, I said, you know, um, there's talk about this. I haven't talked to you about this. I began to talk to them about just the, some things that happened two years ago that, that I'm walking through, and, and, and as I'm talking to them, I'm, I'm there in fear and trembling. When I got finished talking to them, I said, Can, are you ready for the word, or should we go home? They said, great, so I, I brought the word. It's amazing. Ten, when I call for salvation, 10 people, without any pumping or prodding, came walking to the front, 10 people, weeping before the Lord. When I asked for backsliders to come, 15 came and walked up, weeping before the Lord. I got all kinds of letters saying, you don't understand what it did for me. A, a member of my church invited her friend. Here's what her friend said to her. Her friend finally came to church, one of her work buddies. Monday at the job, she pulls my member aside. Here's what she said. I'm going to join your church. And she said, really? She said, yeah, here's why. She said, your pastor is so real. Here's what she said. Here's what she said. She said, and whatever God is doing in him, I want God to do it in me. You are trying to protect the people from your weakness. And what you, I'm not going to tell you to go to tell your whole business, but I'm telling you, you're going to let them know that there's something in you. You need Jesus too. You got to tell me, listen, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you don't do that, this next way, this next dispensation that we're going into is the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. We're going to be telling people why you need Jesus. Forget telling them about their sin. They know about their sin. They need to know about Jesus. They need, they need to know what the gospel is about. Why is it good news? That's what we're going to do. And we're going to give our testimony and let, and let them know what God did for us. There's so many things I want to do, but I got to move quickly because I got nine. Thank you.